Hello and welcome everyone to the Women in Leadership Talk podcast. Super excited. I've got Sabrina Horn here with me today. Sabrina, welcome. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you for having me. It's so great to talk to you and, and to your audience today. Well, we're thrilled to have you and excited to really let our audience know a bit about you. So I'm going to take a moment here and just read your official bio so that they have a sense of who you are. And then we're going to jump right into uh, a lively conversation because we have lots, lots to discuss today. Yes, so right. Sabrina, <laughs> she is an award-winning CEO, speaker, communication expert, and advisor. She's also the best-selling author of Make It, Don't Fake It. And that's leading with authenticity for real business success. And this is what actually caught my eye when I saw your book. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. So we have to have a conversation and have you on our podcast. So her career is highlighted by 25 years as a founder and CEO and president of Horn Group. And that is an iconic U.S. tech communications agency that she founded in Silicon Valley at the age of 29. Her firm has counseled thousands of tech executives and their companies through rapid growth, category creation, brand communication, brand transformation, global expansion, IPOs, acquisitions, pivots, and crisis matters. Wow, that's a lot to deal with, Sabrina, and especially at such a young age. Sabrina has sold Horn Company in 2015 to a group called The Finn Partners, which is a global marketing agency, and she was appointed managing partner of their technology practice. She is currently CEO of Horn Strategy, LLC, a consulting firm focused on helping executive, executives navigate the early stages of their companies. She has a BA in American Studies from Hobart William Smith Colleges and a Master's in Public Relations from Boston University. She also has two amazing daughters, Grace and Christina, and two very large golden doodles. So when we say large, how large are they? Uh, they're about 80 pounds each. <laughs> oh my goodness. So they're, they're quite big. Yes. <laughs> well, if we hear them barking, everybody just bear with us because, you know, they have to protect Sabrina in case somebody yeah. comes to the door. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Actually, I had a friend on the weekend who brought her golden doodle over and, and I hadn't seen him since he was like, you know, maybe four months old. And she said to me, you're going to be shocked when you see him. Like he's massive. And I thought, how big could he get in three months, right? Like he's not that big. He what his paws were bigger than my hands. Mm -hmm. I, was like, I didn't realize yeah. they got so big. <laughs> yeah, he, when I got the first one, um, they said he's medium size, <laughs> and you know now he's like he's massive. So I think next time I'll get like a small one, <laughs> and then it'll end up being medium, medium. size. Yeah, oh, so, that's yeah. awesome. Well, yeah. they're great to have around, I'm sure. Yeah, they certainly are, yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. So, Sabrina, let's jump in. Let's talk a little bit about your background and really, like, you know, what prompted you to write this book about making it, don't fake it? Yeah. Um, so that's a great place to start. I mean, I, um, being a career public relations professional in Silicon Valley, I saw and had the opportunity to participate in a lot of fakery and a lot of people also think that PR is all about spin and just making problems kind of magically go away. But, um, you know, from my career, I learned that actually nothing could be further from the truth and that great public relations and great companies always are grounded in the truth and, and great leaders are always conduct themselves with integrity and with authenticity. And so fast forward to, you know, the last five to 10 years, I, I, I felt like, uh, gosh, you know, like people have kind of forgotten about the fact that integrity matters. And it has become sometimes like a choice, an option and a multiple choice question, mm -hmm. right? And in integrity should never be a choice that you might make. It should just be how you are. Mm -hmm. So that that mantra, fake it till you make it, I um, have always been bothered by it. Um, and, you know, I've heard my daughters use it. I've heard my colleagues use it and and over abuse it. And and I I think it's um, taken really a turn for the worse. So with all of that put together, I thought I'm I'm going to put a pin in that and turn it on its head and write a book about how to lead 
with integrity instead and avoid those temptations to fake it. Mm -hmm. Well, you did a great job in the book and you gave some you. excellent <laughs> examples. Um, I really, I enjoyed reading it and I enjoyed your fake meter that oh. you created. I thought that was great. Yeah. And, and maybe when we get a little bit more into the discussion, we can, we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, cause I think some of the things that you've highlighted are, are really important. And, and even what you've just shared with integrity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't mess up when you tell the truth, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're not covering your story and trying to spin it and all those wonderful things that you were discussing. Um, when you're telling the truth, you don't have to worry about that because you're coming from a place of, you know, what's true for you and, and the integrity and authenticity. So, yeah, I'm excited. So let's, let's continue on here. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about organizing risk. So you talked about that in the book and it's this fear of failure or fear of the unknown. And what I read there was how overwhelming that can be and it can make you want to stick your head in the sand. So how do you how do you guide your, your business clients like to not even go there and, and maybe just share that with us? Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, there are many reasons that cause a person to fake it. Mm -hmm. And fear of failure is, is certainly one of them. You know, the pressure that comes with that, the risk of, of um, being exposed and losing your reputation, losing it all. And, um, and when I was starting my own company at the age of 29, I mean, I, I had four years of job experience. I probably had managed an intern, you know, um, I had never even thought about like what it would mean to run a company. But, but when I made that initial sort of foray and I won that first client and, you know, be careful what you wish for, I thought, okay, like I have to plan for the worst. And this is part of organizing risk, right? Like you have to ask yourself in any situation, what's the worst that could happen here, right? And, and then what would you do about that? What is your backup plan? And in, in essence, this is always an exercise in contingency planning or crisis planning, right? And if you don't think about what that might be, then if it happens or something close to it happens, you know, you're going to get that fear of failure and it, it can unravel you. It could be deer in the headlights and you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, whether you're prone to faking it or you want to fake it or not, like it's a good business practice, right? So organize your risk by thinking, okay, you know, in, in the world of possibilities, what is, what is possible? What could happen? And then what, what will I do about it? And in doing that process, you kind of disarm the fear about it because you know that somewhere, you know, in around all of that, you can find a path down the middle and kind of navigate yourself forward. Mm -hmm. Love that. Love that. Actually, I, I play a game with some of my clients on the what if game, right? Mm -hmm. and, exactly and, and it. it's, yeah, and it's that mind shift that happens or needs to happen because it moves you from being, you know, fixed or, or only seeing what's right in front of you to what are the possibilities. And, and I do it more from a, you know, looking at it more from, you know, where somebody's fearful already and can't move forward, but, you know, well, what if you did do this? Like what might happen, right? Um, that's such a powerful way to shift the way our brains think. And I, I love what you shared there about don't get blindsided, right? Like look at what those contingency plans are and, and have a backup plan because then it it minimizes, right? The, the power that it has over you. Love right. that. Yeah, you know, one more point on that. I think like we all make our plans, but sometimes best laid plans don't materialize. And so if you're counting on certain things to happen within a certain time sequence, right? And something doesn't happen the way you wanted it to, or one piece of it is delayed. You have to think that through in advance and yeah. think about like, you know, in anticipation of that, what will you do? And having thought about all those things in advance also gives you more confidence as a leader and resilience to kind of then lead other people through it and not be um, distracted by it or um, not, not be a good leader. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Well, and I think too, with the last, you know, two and a bit years that we've had, right? Like 
this pandemic has taught us even more so the importance of you know, agility and being able to pivot and, and looking at possibilities, because who would have ever thought that basically our world would shut down for a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so critical. And, and to your point also on crisis management, like <clears throat> being able to lead, you know, it's great to lead in the good times, <laughs> but oh, you, right. Yeah. right, like you, you have to be able yeah. to navigate that because you've got people who are, in, you know, the fear is ingrained in them. And so how do you, how do you help them release that paralysis and start to put one foot in front of the other? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Really yeah. critical. Yeah. So I know in your book, you talked about um, when leaving your employer, <laughs> the importance of not biting the hand that feeds you. So maybe you can just share a little bit about, you know, what your experience was like and, and how that actually impacted the business that you created. Right. Well, I, I, um, I think it is really essential to always try and leave things on a good note in whatever situation that you're in, even if it's contentious to try and leave something on a good note. Um, um, be, because for the simple reason that, you know, your your employers and your previous job experience is part of your network and part of your reputation. Mm -hmm. And you know that saying, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes it is, it is truly a matter of looking at yourself in the mirror and putting your ego aside in the interest of achieving the, the thing that you want to get, which is moving to a new company, perhaps a competitor or starting your own business um, or whatever the situation is. And it's not always possible because in the reality of the world, right? There may be competitive uh, intellectual property issues or legal issues. You know, if you leave your uh, employer who took you under his or her wing and you take their clients and some of their people, that's probably not gonna make them feel too great. Um, and so that was, that was a decision that I made, um, you know, and I thought, well, look, if I'm going to stand on my own, then I have to get my own business and not just take from the people who were kind to me. And I had no ax to grind. Um, I just wanted to do my own thing. So, um, I made a commitment to never knowingly recruit any of their people or take any of their business. Now, you know, if they came to me um, and if, you know, we had that agreement that that was the way it was going to be, then, you know, then I would entertain it. But, um, you know, it was just a philosophy of business, I guess. And it has served me well because uh, both of those women for whom I worked are still my friends. And one of them was actually on my board. So. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. That's powerful, right? Because you, you've kept the relationship going and something, mm -hmm. something my mom used to say to me <laughs> at a very young age, she would, she would say, remember that the ass you kick today. Yeah. <laughs> when you kiss tomorrow. <laughs> so you never know, right? Where you're going to, where it's going to come back around. So to your point, full circle. Yeah. Um, but it's also just smart because as big as the world is, the world is actually very small. Oh, Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So just, you know, th th those are, I think that's a really good, um, good words of wisdom. And I, and I loved, you know, when you talked about that in the book and, and how that, it also helped you propel your business um, because you had built a reputation and they were also supportive of you because there were clients that, that weren't right fits for them. And they were able to, you know, refer some of those yeah. clients to you Absolutely. and vice versa. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no need to create uh, disharmony or bad feelings, if you can avoid it, yeah. do it and, you know, and strive. I mean, they weren't thrilled that I was leaving. Um, and I explained it to them, but you know, it just wasn't, I mean, of course it's like, it wasn't a happy situation, but I, I, I told them, I, I told them what my promise was mm -hmm. and, um, you try and, and make, make the best of it and then, and then hold to that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that leads us into my next question, because clearly you've got very strong values, right? Mm -hmm. and, and values are, uh, I think, sometimes underrated by people when they start businesses or even for themselves, right? Or, or even having the awareness of what their values are. So, you know, 
I know you, you refer to this in your book and, and clearly when you're speaking, I can hear it. So why do you feel this is so critical for, you know, how you, how you operate as a person, but also how you operate your business? Yeah. I, um, I mean, when I started out, I wasn't, um, so self-aware of that. I just knew how I was going to how I was going to conduct myself and I was going to keep it real simple. I think our founding values were like, um, work hard, <laughs> um, be honest, move fast, um, and be creative. And, you know, you could put them on less than an index card. Nice. Um, and, and it was really only me, myself and I for a while there. Um, but, um, I, I think that they are so important and they need to be established from the beginning because like a company's culture and how people behave, how they treat each other, the traditions you celebrate all stem from a set of core values. And who else is better than to, to create those values, right? Than the founder or the CEO or the, the leadership team of that, of that company. Everything, all those, those values are inside every fiber of a company um, from culture, as I said, to business processes like creativity, if that's a, if that's a value or honesty, then how does creativity uh, or honesty manifest itself in customer service? How do you talk to your customers? How quickly do you get back to them? How honest are you about supply of your couch when there's a pandemic and it's not gonna be available for a long time? You know, like- um, Good example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, like uh, it's it's it is essential to uh, building a powerful and authentic brand that stands the test of time because all of that becomes like the halo effect um, of of a company. And when I talk about building an authentic brand, right, it it, it stems from those core values and um, a, a brand is essentially it's many things, but it is above all a consistent customer experience and the relationship that a customer has with, with, a, with a company or a product. And when that experience is disrupted or changes or deteriorates, it's because something in the company, in the culture or in a business process fell out of alignment in a way with a core value. And that there's, you know, lots of shades of gray um, in that. But, but if you stay closely aligned with those core values and constantly force yourself to come back to them and talk about them, right, it, it keeps you in check. Yeah, 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 I love that. And that's so true because, you know, several things that you said there, you, you actually made me go back into my own, you know, executive world when um, I was working in retail. And, you know, it's, if you're not taking care of the customer, somebody else will, right? Yeah. And so okay. it really, it is making that part of your DNA of how you communicate, how you, you know, how you treat your customers and customers come in different fashions, right? It's your external customer, but also internally, you yeah. have customers within departments, right? Yes. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, I, I, even myself, when I became a president for the first time, that was something I really tried to um, ingrain in my people. So in the office, it was like, okay, the stores, the warehouse, these are your customers. And so how you treat them will be a reflection of how they treat our external customers. Like such a, such a, it's a simple, it's a simple comment, but it is such a powerful, yeah. um, you know, embodiment that if you don't do it, a lot of times that's how businesses go out of business. Yeah. I mean, so here's the thing, like it's easy to miss because in fact, it's so simple. And a lot of entrepreneurs I speak with think like, oh, values, you know, that can come later. Like that's the soft stuff. Branding, that's something we can think about later. Like, you know, true, you don't have to hire an, a big agency when you're, when you have nothing and you're just starting out because that doesn't make sense. But having a clear sense of what your value proposition is and what customers can expect and holding true to that as a plumb line, right? That, that is essential 
Um, and you know, let if you if you think about much larger companies that have stood the test of time, right? Markets change, consumer trends change, um, demand changes. People want different things, and it, I, I will also say it is important to always kind of evaluate if your values are still um, uh, aligned in the right order, right? It's not that values disappear, but they can take on new meaning, right? When the values of a, of a company with 5 million in revenue may be different than a, a company um, with uh, 100 million in revenue, right? And so it's okay to reevaluate them and maybe shift the order or assign new meaning to them as a company grows or contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so critical. Again, that goes back to what we were talking about a minute ago about like even the pandemic, it's made you realize, or it should, I, I hope that businesses have realized that importance of how do you pivot, but you still stay true to the core of, of who you are. Yep. I, I, I love that. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that that you had spoke about was, you know, becoming a CEO and being reminded that it's not so much the, the destination, it's more about the journey. Um, I thought that was a really important comment that you made about how you're always becoming a CEO. So why is this, well, first of all, maybe you can share some examples, but why is this so important to recognize that it's not like a finite ending <laughs> once you once you become that CEO. Right. Yeah, I, I it was something that I realized, I think, early on in the first five years that like you're always you should, as a human being, always be learning, right? If you stop learning, you stop growing. And there's always something new to learn. And yes, you may become more resilient. And yes, you may have seen more scenarios and situations that you know how to navigate more efficiently and like oh yeah I remember that this is how we're going to handle this play right but even experienced CEOs when they go to a different company mm -hmm. there are new problems to solve in different markets that you may not be as familiar with um, things can happen like pandemics right that um that cause you to retrench and figure out new ways of working that you've never had to figure out before. And so it's, um, I used to have this saying, which was the day that I think I've made it is the day I should quit my job mm -hmm. because you're always making it right. You're always being challenged and growing and learning and becoming a better professional and, and uh, hopefully a better person. Um, so um, the, you know, the other approach, like if you've arrived, then, then well, well what else are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, okay, that's the end then bye. Like, you know, so what, like, so it's, it's kind of a, a dead end street. So, um, that's a, a personal philosophy, but I think it's, it's important and an aspirational one for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it also it's this, you know, I think it, it goes both ways, right? If you're the CEO and you think, okay, now that I'm the CEO, that's it. A big mistake <laughs> because it's not, but it's also the perception, I think, from the people you lead, right? Because the people we lead always thinks, oh, well, you know, the CEO has to have all the answers and, and, and that's not really that the way it works. The CEO has to have the great questions, but they don't have all the answers. Yes. Um, and I think that somehow we need to, you know, help make that shift so that people understand that because you said this earlier about putting your ego to the side, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes that's what gets in the way of great leaders or great executives. They think, oh my God, I have to know this because I'll be outed if I don't know, right? Or I'm not going to be valuable to the tribe any longer. And so I think it's that's a really important um, component, I would say, to, to leadership, to maintain that curiosity and to keep growing. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Like I, um, I, I do think that there, there is a thing that executives have when they are promoted to the next level or a CEO is just, you're at the top. Right. And so by definition, you think you should have all the answers. Um, and certainly that was how I felt as a very young, inexperienced 
CEO of my company. Me too. And, <laughs> and, it, and it caused me to fake it because I felt like, oh my God, like, I don't, I don't know the answer to this. Like what? And like, I haven't even thought about that yet. And so I would fake it and make something up, um, which I then had to later sort of rejigger and correct. And people would say like, well, but you said this before and now you're saying this. And, you know, so wouldn't it be better to just say, that's a really, really interesting question. You know what, I'm going to take that to my team. And, you know, would you like to join me in that conversation? And so we can figure it out or, or, you know what, I, I don't know, tell me more, tell me more what you're, what you're thinking there. I'd like to think about that. And let me get back to you in two days. Right. That, that's so much better than saying like, blah, 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 like making something up. Right. But, um, but that takes, that takes humility um, and setting your ego aside and knowing that that's actually okay. And not only is it okay, but better yes. to, to do it that way. Yeah. Good, couldn't agree more. And actually that just prompts, you know, one of my questions, because one of my favorite parts in the whole book is this short course on humility. So oh, maybe just, right. let's talk about that. Cause I mean, yes. you've worked with, you know, hundreds of clients, so maybe share that with us. Yeah. I mean, I, um, a, a lot of the CEOs in Silicon Valley that I work with did not, but that word wasn't in their vocabulary. <laughs> um, Didn't think and, so. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so, so, so I felt like in order to do a good job for them, right. It's, it's, as I said at the beginning, right. It's not about spin. It's about peeling back the onion and getting down to, to the core. Like, what are they afraid of? What's the worst thing that could happen to them? What if the product doesn't ship on time? Um, uh, you know, what's the perception of your business and yourself out there in the industry? Um, are you a good spokesperson? And, um, and getting them comfortable enough with you to, to create, I, you know, the word is a safe space where they feel like that you are a trusted advisor. And, and that's, that's really the, the relationship you want to achieve because only then, right, when you really know what you're dealing with, can you start to find a path forward and, and execute on a strategy. Um, and the other piece of humility is admitting when you've made a mistake. And when something hasn't worked, right? There are plenty of examples I, I showed in the book about it, you know, a pitch where we failed miserably, where I even started to cry. And um, uh, and then coming back, you know, to, to your office or to your team online and getting everybody together, not to point fingers, but to say like, okay, well, that kind of sucked. <laughs> that didn't go so well. Um, can we can we talk about where it went off the rails? Um, what could we have done differently? And it starts with you, with the leader, to say, "Here's what I think I want us to do," and I will take ownership of making sure we have more resources to do ABC, so that next time, you know, this will be better. And it's called a post mortem. Um, uh, in you know business terms, um, but I think it, you can call it anything you want. The key is to be honest and have you start off first, so that everyone else feels comfortable enough to do the same. It creates a spirit of collaboration and um, togetherness, right? That moves things forward rather than CYA and oh no, I didn't do that and or political culture. But the the most essential part of doing this. Uh, is to then institutionalize the things that you say you could have done differently into actual processes. Yeah. And like that, that could even be a separate meeting or a separate conversation, because if you don't do that, then, then what was the point, right? The, the problem will just persist. Yeah. Wow. You said a lot of powerful things there, that co-creation, the mm -hmm. engagement, when you take ownership of it and say, Hey, you know what, this didn't work you know, let's all talk about how we can improve that process or like yeah. that is such a, such a critical component to how you run any business, right? So yeah. it's that yeah. collaboration and getting people to be part of the solution versus part of the problem or being blamed. And we see this all the time, right? Like somebody, 
you know, I, I mean, I'm just as I said that a couple of examples came to my mind just even recently of, you know, here in Canada, they fired the chief of police in Ottawa because they used him as the scapegoat for the disaster that our government created. Right. And like that happens all the time. People know this. <laughs> right. You're not getting away with anything. So it, it's better to own it and admit to, you know what, that direction wasn't the right direction. So yeah. how do we course correct and let's do it together. Yeah. Uh, that's such a that's such a key piece to any leadership, but it's also at the fundamental. It's walking your talk. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is in some cases though, it is easier said than done, right? The, the reason, course. the reason why people fake it um, and cannot exercise humility is, is because reality can be very hard to face. Right. Yes. Um, and it's, it's what happens when there's a crisis, a, there's a product recall, um, the Boeing Max aircraft disaster, for example, right? Only certain facts were told. It was selective truth telling. There was not full transparency. Um, sometimes, you know, there's a crisis. You don't know what to do. You shove the problem under the rug. Hope it all goes away, right? And um, and and that can have like dire consequences. It can make the the crisis worse. And you know, it's it is far better far better to come forward and face the, the music about a mistake you made, talk about what happened, the impact of that, and the steps that are being taken, right? And then repair your reputation, then being caught later on for a massive lie, probably multiple lies, right? And then being forced out of your business. So neither of those two options are great, but it's much better to be honest and forthcoming and, you know, probably find forgiveness um, more, more so than you would uh, in the other scenario. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you, you get, a, you get, you salvage a little bit of credibility, yes. right? When you, when you're telling the truth versus putting it, you know, burying it under the rug and, and because eventually it always comes out, somebody always figures it out. <laughs> so right. you might as well, you know, own it and, you know, then, navigate from there to your point earlier from you know, when you were talking about those contingency plans and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just taking responsibility for it. So um, what keeps coming to my mind is this fake meter that you created. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think that, you know, that's an important piece because people go, oh, but sometimes if my confidence is not there, then, mm -hmm. you know, I sometimes I feel like I have to fake it till I make it. I, I can tell you myself because I was very young as a as a president as well and male dominated industry. And so it was like, OK, you know, I'm just going to fake it until I figure it out. And and yeah. I did and, and was successful at it. And then eventually I was like, you know, the more every day goes by, the more you learn. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe talk about the fakeometer a little bit, just to, to give the audience a, just a glimpse of what they could find in, in your book. Yeah. So um, when I was writing the book, I, in the beginning, I thought about like, what are all the ways that people fake it? Like from the innocent cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of acting as if ways to when you cross the line and exaggerate the, the truth or minimize the facts to a selective truth telling to, you know, like off the charts, like jail time <laughs> kind of stuff, like total fraud and deception. And I thought, I'm going to put this all on a continuum. And I, I thought like, well, it's kind of like a meter. So I called it the, the fake meter or the fakeometer. And um, there is a point um, on that continuum where you do cross the line to from fake it till you make it in its origins, which was actually fairly innocent, right? Where you are um, trying to, you try to emulate the behaviors that you wish you could exude. And so you, you think about how you can act more confident in a certain situation or visualize yourself in it or power posing, which was something Amy Cuddy um, mm -hmm. espoused several years ago, right? All of that is cool. And you can call it faking it. Um, I just don't like that term, right? It's, it's just that you're, you're trying to better yourself. That's all fine. Um, but you cross the line when you say and do things at other people's expense for personal gain. So examples, very specific examples there would be 
lying or stretching the truth to an investor or a customer about what your product can do in order to get their money or to win the deal, right? Um, lying on your resume, lying in a job interview, um, all of those examples, right? It may get you to, to point A and you may get the second meeting, but here's the thing, like, and you said it yourself, the truth always comes out. The investor is going to do her due diligence about your technology and look under the hood. And they're going to discover that actually your product doesn't do what you said. The customer may actually buy the product, great, but when they use it, they'll find out that it doesn't do what you said. So they will they might post on social media about that and tell everybody not to buy your product, right? Or cause other problems for you. Um, and of course, employers, you know, most, most of them check references and check where you went to school and, and what you did. So, you, you know, it, it's never a win-win situation, really. It may get you to point A, but the truth always comes out. And when it does, you'll ruin your reputation. You'll set yourself back. And while you're waiting for the truth to come out, you're going to have anxiety, <laughs> right? About like, oh my God, like, is this going to come out, right? Um, so like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. It's better to, to find yourself on that continuum and say like, this is how I feel right now. I feel under pressure. We're behind the eight ball. We need the money, blah, 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 blah. How can I, how can I tell the most compelling story within the boundaries of what the truth is to, to still win that deal or take a different path uh, rather than face exposure? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that ties back to what you were saying earlier with your values, the integrity, right? Uh, and that says volume to anyone that you potentially could be working with, whether it's employees, whether it's customers, um, such a, such a, oh, so critical, so critical. Yeah. Just again, it goes back to owning it. Yeah. So, you know, just, I know we're, we're getting close on our time here. Um, maybe just yeah, quickly, if you would share, <laughs> share a couple of examples. You were 29 years old, yep. um, you know, heavy male dominated industry, lots of BS. <laughs> Mm -hmm. how, how did you, how did you stay true to your values and, you know, ensuring that that authenticity was in place? Cause I mean, clearly you've given some great examples and that's really important to you. So how did you stay true to that? Yeah, I, I think, um, I learned to stay true to it by not staying true to it and the fallout from that. Um, there were times when, when we were behind the eight ball and we needed to bring in some revenue fast and we overpromised what we could do and very quickly uh, under delivered and then lost pieces of business and lost all of it along with a piece of our reputation right um so so i fell prey to that also and uh, not sticking true to being authentic about what we could and couldn't do um uh, you know, there are other examples where it worked so great when during the recession and cash was really tight. Um, we had a client who had a new CEO, a very powerful woman who had lots of experience. Uh, and the account was $20,000 a month, which was a you know, quarter million dollars a year pays for a lot of people's salaries. Mm -hmm. And, um, but she was abusive to uh, the men actually on, on my team. Um, so kind of a different kind of gender bias. And uh, we had conversations with her and, you know, here, here's what's working, here's what's not, uh, here's, here's how we can improve. Um, I couldn't afford to, to lose that revenue, but I knew that it probably wasn't going to work with her. So I established a plan, right? And I like, my employees are everything. And they, without them, there was no company. So in three months, I thought we're going to let her go, but we need to figure out how to make up the revenue between now and then. And, and so we did, we developed a plan and a strategy. We won pieces of other business. Uh, and, and I'll never forget the day. And I called her up and she was on her way to the airport. And I said, I'm firing you because you don't get to treat my people that way. And a few words were exchanged 
And, uh, you know, but, but what I lost in revenue, I had made up already, right? Because I had a strategy and I gained in more loyalty and camaraderie from my team. So that, that's, that was a good example of sticking to my values. That's an awesome example, actually. <laughs> and it, it, you know, for our audience listening, I mean, you know, sometimes we think we're in situations where we have to tolerate certain things. And that's a beautiful example of always go back to what your truth is, no matter, no matter what situation you're in. And if you plan, you can overcome it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are situations where you, you can't just cut it off. Right. Um, because it's too disruptive for one reason or another. So you have to make a plan, but, but like, that's just good business, right? That's good strategy and good planning. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that, that was, that was a good one for us. That was a good win. Yeah. That's awesome. Great example. So we're going to wrap up here, but maybe, maybe you could share one or two things that you think our audience could walk away with and implement today. Like what would be, what would have an impact? Yeah, I guess I would say, um, you know, uh, a few things like think, think about the last time that you faked it. And it could just be, it could be something personal to impress somebody or something in a business sense. And ask yourself what made you want to fake it? Like what triggered that? Was it fear? Was, were you under pressure? Did you just not know what to do? And, and then, and ask what, like, what were the consequences of that? Did you pull it off? Were you exposed? Um, (laughs) How did you feel about it? Were you proud of yourself, you know, or, or were you embarrassed? Um, and, and then, and then ask yourself like, well, if I had a do over, how would I do it differently? Right. If I could have in that moment, just had the presence of mind to take a different path, right. Would there have been a different outcome or a better uh, feeling about it as a, as a leader? Right. Um, uh, I, that's, I guess what I would close with, right. To, to challenge yourself, to think differently. Yeah, that's a that's a great. I love that. Love that. Some some awareness building and reflection on, you know, how would you plan to do better next time? And instead of again, don't blame others. <laughs> Take responsibility. Awesome. Right. So, Sabrina, this has been a great conversation. Amazing tips. So, I, I'm sure our audience would be excited to read your book. So, how do they how do they find your book? Yes. Well, um, thank you for saying that. Um, you can certainly find my book on Amazon under my name, Sabrina Horn, or under the title, Make It, Don't Fake It. Um, it's available in digital, audio, and um, paperback. Uh, but you can also go to my website, which is sabrinahorn.com forward slash book. And there's a list of uh, several independent bookstore, online bookstores, um, and other outlets where you can um get it if you don't want to go to Amazon. Um, And you can also find more information there about about me and some of the other work that I'm doing. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, This has been wonderful and very insightful. Um, You made me, I I, honestly, as we were talking, it took me back in time and I'm going, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Some of those things I wish I had done differently, but have certainly self-corrected now. Yeah. Um, yeah, Really great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Vicki. And thanks to everybody for listening today. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I'll echo that. Thank you. Our audience uh, who joined us for Will and Pat. (laughs) Oops. You okay? (laughs) I just good timing. Bless you. Timing. It's the allergies are starting to hit me. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. That turned out that was actually perfect timing. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I just want to thank our audience because we know you have a choice as to what podcast you listen to, um, and and you know our hopes is that you'll always take away some valuable tips, uh, and we hope that you'll join us again for the Women in Leadership Talk podcast, and we look forward to, to hearing you or seeing you on the next show. So, thank you, everyone. Have a thank great you. day. Thank you.